Okay, our next author we're going to focus on is Phyllis Wheatley, and I'll bring up some of her resources here. Your Norton has a, a couple poems by her that we're going to be reading this week and some letters, so we'll be looking at those excerpts. I know in some respect many of you have heard of Phyllis Wheatley before, um, and that's great because I think she's included in a great deal of history textbooks, but the most important things to remember um, before reading her poetry about her biography, and I'll bring up her Poetry Foundation page quick here, is that she is the first um, African American woman to publish a book of poetry. So um, we want to think about that in the context of sort of how she achieved her reputation as a writer. Um, becoming one of the most, especially as Norton talks about, a controversial and enigmatic figure in the history of African American literature. Um, so we want to look a little bit about her life, um, the fact that, you know, her poetry has been adopted into all these different languages and forms, um, and just a little bit more about her writing background and sort of how she came to um, very much write in this capacity. I think is really, really important. So you have a couple things in your um, biography about her as well. There are an extensive number. This is the Poetry Foundation who has some really great sources on Phyllis Wheatley, including poems, related content, different podcast episodes, which are really fun to listen to that mention her, and some different articles. So I would encourage you, um, most especially if she ends up being a writer that you want to research and look a little bit more at, um, that you that you really sort of do that too. The sort of synopsis is that she is born into West Africa. She's sold into slavery when she's about seven or eight, and then she's taken to North America. Um, hence her last name, she's purchased by the Wheatley family in Boston. They taught her to read and write and encouraged her uh, to especially write poetry when they saw how incredibly talented she was at doing that. So um, from what we know, we don't know exactly when and where she was born. They estimate around the year 1753 in what, you know, in what, what really what in what West Africa would be probably today about um, Gambia or Senegal. She was sold to a chief by a trader, took her to Boston um, on a ship actually called the Phyllis. And so then when she gets to Boston, she's resold to the Wheatley family, to John Wheatley. He was a merchant and tailor. He bought Phyllis for his, um, for his wife, so she would be his servant. Uh, they named her Phyllis after the ship, and then uh, she was given the name Wheatley, sort of as a custom um, for any surname that was used for anyone in slavery. Um, it was, and, and this is sort of, you know, mentioned numerous times in both, you know, the biographies here and the one in your Norton as well, that um, it was really um, their 18-year-old daughter, Mary, who first tutored Phyllis in reading and writing. Uh, Nathaniel, who's also mentioned here, um, did help in that as well. And from the interest you can see, uh, Phyllis was very much immersed in the Bible, astronomy, geography, history, British literature, especially John Milton and Pope and a lot of the Greek and Latin classics. Um, Homer, we'll see how mythology plays kind of a role in even her own, um, her own poetry. Um, as mentioned, her probably the first poem she wrote but not published until 1773 was to the University of Cambridge in New England and uh, really very much after this was when the Wheatley family supported her education. They basically left all the other household labor up to their domestic slaves while um, they could sort of show off her abilities to her friends and family. Um, when she was 20 years old she went with uh, Nathaniel Wheatley to London partly for health but they also thought she would have a better chance of um, developing and publishing her book over there. Um, she she did have a little bit of interaction with some members of British society. Um, and so she, hopefully they were thinking she could meet with, um, you know, a countess over there who eventually would serve after to be sort of like a patron of her poems and help publish. Um, she wrote several different letters that are included in your Norton here. Um, one of them being that you'll learn a little bit more of the backstory about she wrote a letter, uh, she wrote a letter to Reverend Samson um, Ockham, O-C-C-O-M. He was a member um, of, uh, you know, a Native American tribe from what would be roughly today Connecticut. 
he became a Presbyterian um, cleric at the time. He was the first Native American to publish his writings in English. Um, he ended up founding a couple of different settlements um, and did some missionary work. So she writes this letter to him, commending him on his ideas, on his beliefs, how slaves should be given their natural born whites in America. She also exchanges letters with another British philanthropist, John Thornton. Um, along with her poetry, it was through letters and comments and these ways that she was able to express herself. The other famous um, sort of piece that's included, um, as they'll mention down here, and they'll mention it in um, your Norton as well, is her copy of her poem that in 1775 she sent to His Excellency George Washington. Um, the year after, Washington actually invited Wheatley to visit him at his headquarters in Cambridge, and she did that. Um, and then Thomas Paine, whom we'll look at this semester too, um, in regards to sort of his role, republished the poem in the Pennsylvania Gazette in April 1776. So that was very interesting. Um, you can see here by the time she was 18, she had about 28 poems for which actually ran for advertisement from subscribers. Now, when colonists, of course, were unwilling to buy literature supported by an African American, that's primarily the reason why they went over to London in the first place, um, where at least there was a little bit more of a readership and openness to that too. Um, it is believed that sometime between 1773 and the summer that she was emancipated by the Wheatley family after her book called The Poems on Subjects, Religious and Moral, came out in London. Um, the mother, the wife, Susanna Wheatley, died in 1774, and then the husband, John Wheatley, in 1778. Um, right after that, Phyllis Wheatley met and married John Peters, who was a free black grocer, but they very much struggled in their lifetime. They didn't have enough money. They had poor living conditions. Two of her children died. And so um, in 1779, she actually submitted a, a second sort of proposal to get po uh, poems published. But because of her financial situation, um, the loss of the Wheatley family, um, and then the war, the Revolutionary War was going on. Uh, it didn't really end up going amounting to everything. And then sort of a really tragic end. Um, her husband was imprisoned for debt. That left Phil Sweetly taking care of a um, very, very sick infant son after that. She was working as a maid at the boarding house. Don't forget, she never really did any labor throughout her lifetime. Um, she wasn't really asked to do any of that, especially when they noticed her talents as a writer. Um, so that was one thing. She ends up passing away. Um, we learn a little bit more. She suffered from, you know, chronic at. Of course, that's not really probably, you know, very much, you know, kind of treated and or talked about at the time or even really, you know, um, that it the right way it was supposed to. She ends up becoming really, really ill. Um, after that, you know, coming back here, she's only 31 when she passes away. So she's incredibly young when she passes away um, and really sort of a very tragic end to her lifetime. Um, so it's it sort of takes, yeah, her, her life takes a, a great different sort of turn, especially towards the latter part. Um, you'll look at a couple different passages here. So I'm really excited to go through and like annotate some of her letters this week. Um, go through, of course, to the University of Cambridge in New England. On the death of the Reverend Mr. George Whitefield, you have a couple other letters in here to His Excellency George Washington, to Samson Oakham, who I mentioned, uh, she corresponded and looked greatly to, to SM, a young African painter on seeing his works, is um, uh, the letter, the poem to Scipio Moorhead, who is the slave of the Reverend John Moorhead of Boston. So there's a lot that we can certainly kind of consider and to um, look at with her poetry. It's really important. And then, of course, you know, we read this past week um, how Jupiter Hammond wrote his ode to Phyllis Wheatley and the address to Miss Phyllis Wheatley. So we want to definitely do, you know, H Hammond saw Wheatley sort of succumbing to what he felt like were these influences in her writing, almost like pagan influences in that way. And that's why he sort of wrote the whole address to her, those, 
rhyming quatrains, you know, everything with the related Bible verse, because he felt like this would be the way to compel her to come back to the Christian path. So we want to kind of do comparisons um, with now that you'll have read both poets before. Um, she truly believed in the power of poetry, um, which is, you know, you can look at the arrangement of her different poems. We'll certainly look at that on here. Um, we'll look at some of the references. Her legacy has obviously lived on, you know, as this sort of fundamental, um, the absolutely fundamental author of African American literature. This honor as the first African American woman to publish a book of poetry, and not only to publish a book of poetry, but to make a living, to make actual money. Um, Tamisinius is in your book as well that we're going to be looking at. Um, so there's a couple different um, ways that we can go through and compare her pieces. I've also started to add, there's just tons of different more materials, again, here on Phyllis Wheatley. Um, limited, a couple pictures if you want to see some up here, or, you know, portraits that were reportedly done. Um, you know, SM, who you're going to be uh, reading in a second, famous, the portrait of Phyllis Wheatley. So I think um, thinking about Phyllis Wheatley in different contexts from what you've heard about in history books, I think she was very much aware of her position. She worked hard to show that she was aware that given the training and the opportunity, she truly believed that African Americans could write verse as well as any educated person, you know, starting up at the time period. Now, most of her verses were written for prominent white figures in the time period, like George Washington, or as she addresses some of these um, men and even women in the sort of Boston society. But um, in several of her different elegies and kind of her nature pieces, they are very largely accessible. Um, but it is mostly a white audience to whom she's to whom she's really writing. Um, so very much you want to think about her racial awareness. You want to think of herself and her role in this time period. Um, her her abilities as a poet, I think, are really important. You know how well she kind of. Um, moves us to be more racially aware in her own sort of anti-slavery movements and um, to talk about the way education plays a really big part for her too. So with these different biographies, I think it's really important to kind of compare and to see, um, you know, how her background has really played into her writing as well, thus being a very short background because she did not live a very long life. Um, so I really hope you enjoy looking at the different pieces in here. Well, our questions and our annotations will kind of surround, um, you know, some of the pieces. Some of them you'll just read sort of for background knowledge. Um, but I can tell you some of them are some of my favorite um, poems that she has that are included in your Norton. So definitely make sure to take a look at some of the other resources. I have a feeling I know some of you will really like to explore and write about her um, quite a bit more this semester.